looking for. All right. Thanks very much, guys. So we're going to move away from elephants. Uh, Pete Goodwin's going to chat to us about Zacharano populations and sharks. What are the shorts doing? You guys want to open those windows at the back there just to turn it down a bit. I can see people getting really red in the face here. Okay, thank you. And it's, is, it, is it just a down What temperature would you like? 18 or 15? Yeah. I'll get it. 15. You can use this with the lasers. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if, you've see, if you've seen some messy ecology um, to now, this is even messier. Okay, um, <laughs> the Black Rhino Range Expansion Program and our attempts to try and uh, rescue. Or, or manage the black rhino population in KZN. Just a bit of background. We've had a lot of background for those of you who were here on Monday, but a lot of it was kind of, this is the population of rhino as a whole uh, in South Africa, and this is mainly the emphasis there was on, on the levels to which they uh, were being poached and, and so on, and what those trends were. Just a bit of background on the... The black rhino, which is what we're talking about here, Dysros barcornis minor. It's a critically endangered species, according to the IUCN. This is that's the international assessment. In the South African assessment, it uh, was um, classified as endangered, uh, rather uh, some time ago, nearly 10 years ago now, and I presume it, um, there will be a reassessment done fairly shortly. Um, in South Africa, the population of black rhino has uh, been increasing um, at about 3.9% per annum over the last 13 years. So to address the, its endangered status, um, the whole objective of the BMPS, Biodiversity Management Plan, species for the black rhino is to increase the population up to an estimated uh, size of 3,000 in South Africa as quickly as possible. Um, now, both the, the national BMPS and our uh, KZN Black Rhino Management Strategy, both the old and revised version, calls for a population growth rate of 5%. And the reason for that is that we're trying to uh, recover this population as rapidly as possible. Um, and at the time that we started implementing this policy of, of trying to grow our population to 5% per annum. It was perceived at the time that our KZN wildlife reserves that had black rhino were in fact already at carrying capacity. Most of the populations had stagnated. Um, <coughs> they'd, um, they'd either um, overshot carrying capacity and declined, or they had achieved carrying capacity and um, were very non-productive. So the only possible strategy that we could use to try and achieve the overall uh, targets for, um, for the, the population, the population target, which is South African um, 3,000, and the uh, KZN target of 740 of those, of those uh, 3,000 nationally, is to expand the range uh, of, of the, the distribution and range of black rhino. Um, so, a, um, Isambela in 2003 entered into a <coughs> partnership with WWF and the uh, Black Rhino Range Expansion Program was uh, conceived and commenced with the first custodian agreements and translocation of Black Rhino onto private land in 2004. Since then, our population has grown at a rate of 1.7% per annum, which is well below the desired target. Now, this whole Black Rhino management program is uh, pitched in the context of an adaptive management program. <coughs> but more background, since 2004, the BREF program has established a further six populations on private and communal <coughs> land, 
<coughs> one of which is outside the province. And um, one could say, well, that's not assisting us um, in the province to grow our population in the province. But at the time, <coughs> there weren't any options to uh, translocate these uh, uh, property options, to translocate them within the province. So they went out of the province. And at least that's contributing to the achievement of the national goal. Uh, sorry, just on, on, on that, you can see uh, the, on the graph at the bottom there, you can see how the population generally overall has grown, how the uh, population in protected areas as a result of the harvesting has <coughs> slightly declined and stabilized. That's, that's pretty much a, a standard um, reaction from a population which comes from a, a, a very either low or under harvested state one gets a decline and the productivity increases but in this instance most of those removals have been translocated into the BREP sites or into other protected areas um, <coughs> that became available such as uh, Ozabini, um in the Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park. Okay, so what are, the, what are the assumptions around what we're trying to achieve here? Um, firstly, 90% of the translocations or removals from our protected areas um, came from three donor reserves. Okay, I'm calling them the, do the major donor reserves. So only 10% came from other much smaller populations, and very often they were ones and twos, and they were males, and so on. But um, in, in the spirit of this analysis, what I'm looking at are the three major donor reserves. Four of the private and communal properties have populations that have been established for four or more years, and these are called the receiver reserves in the analysis that I'm going to do now. One of the difficulties with this kind of data is that if one is looking at time series data, you can't look at two years' worth of data or three years' worth of data. You're not getting, it's not meaningful to look at those statistics. So we're trying to, I'm trying to choose data sets for, for which we have four or at least five and up to seven uh, years of data in our, in our donor, uh, donor population. Since the receiver reserves, uh, when, they, when the runners were established, are well below ecological carrying capacity. In other words, we're introducing them into a situation where there's been no impact on the food from rice <coughs> and very low competition from other animals. We expect their population growth rates to be much higher than those in the, the, um, the, the donor reserves. We expect the <coughs> fecundity rates to be higher um, and we ex expect natural mortality rates to be lower. These are all the consequences of density dependence in populations that are, are close to carrying capacity. And just as an underlying uh, hypothesis um, at the bottom there, which I won't delve on um, until the end, is that I hypothesize that black rhinos are really badly behaved animals. <laughs> and we, we, shall, we shall see whether we can verify that or not at the, at the end. <coughs> Okay, so let's look at some of the data. The, here are the population growth rates. We have our, on all of the graphs that I present, the, the three donor reserves are these ones on the left, and the three receiver reserves are the ones on the right. And then I've, I've, I've brought them together in a, in a single <coughs> comparison uh, in a right-hand graph there. The first thing that's, that's very striking in these uh, data are that they, the, vari the variability of interannual population growth rate is very high. You can see, um, for instance, the Kuzi Game Reserve here, extremely high. Some years, absolutely no, um, or negative growth rates, in other words, mortalities are exceeding <coughs> births, um, and in other years, um, you know, growth rates of 15%, okay? Some populations here, also growth rates of up to 19%. Nevertheless, if you look at the the, um, the medians of all of these, you can see that most of the donor reserves are sitting here at about just below 5% um, or just on 5%. Um, some of the, res the, the receiver reserves <coughs> um, are sitting um, above 5%, but there are two receiver reserves that are sitting well below the, f the 5% mark. If you take the average across all of these, or the, 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 the mean here, because we're dealing with 
much more normal data and these things here, we can see that in fact they are virtually identical, the growth rates of the populations that have been <coughs> retained within the protected areas and harvested and the growth rates of the, of the <coughs> populations that have been established in our, um, in our, our receiver reserves. So on average, there's no difference in the growth rates between the, uh, the donor and the receiver reserves. However, it's a slightly unfair comparison. The donor reserves typically are female biased. Why? Because managers, quite rightly, are trying to maximize the production from these reserves. So they tend to take off more males than females. So receiver reserves get an introduced population which is male biased. Now, you can't expect a population that's got three females in it and six males to be producing at the same rate as a, as a comparable population that's got um, 30 females and 15 males in it. So growth rate is probably <coughs> not a nice statistic to use to compare these two, uh, these two scenarios. If we move then on to fecundity rate, again, Variability in interannual fecundity rate is very high. Here are our donor reserves. Okay, and we see <coughs> that, our, our, just by the way, we do have a target fecundity rate. We're trying to, uh, uh, ri black rhinos, if they're uh, increasing at the transit rate of increase, their fecundity rates lie at about uh, 0.33 to 0.35. In other words, they're having a, a, a cough on average every three years, or just under three years. Um, We've, we've tried to set, try and maximize production. We've set a target uh, fecundity rate of about 0.25, which on this graph, graph sits there. Okay? And you can see, in, the, in most part, our donor reserves are falling below those fecundity rates. Okay? They're falling below the 0.25 uh, level. The receiver reserves, however, also have a variable um, response. Two of the receiver <coughs> reserves have exceedingly high fecundity rates, exceeding um, the, the, the target of 0.25 by, 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 uh, by a considerable amount, high variability, which one expects in small populations, a function of small population dynamics this, but on, on uh, the, the central tendency here is well above the 0.3. But then what, what explains these two? Why are we getting these two <coughs> reserves that have very poor fecundity rates? However, if one brings the, the data all together, you can see on, on, um, on average, the donor reserves <coughs> have a lower fecundity rate. It's actually, this is the median here, the, 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 of, of around about 0.19, whereas the um, receiver reserves do have higher fecundity rates. They are starting to pop out calves at a much higher rate than um, the, the populations that are in the donor reserves. And uh, on average, it's, it's meeting <coughs> our, our target rate, but only just. Natural mortality rates, we... Um, how am I doing for time? Are we near? Come on, I'll finish it. I've done. Okay. Um, mortality rates, the important thing here is, uh, just remember we're trying to, uh, we're saying that our mortality rates in these uh, uh, receiver reserves should be lower than the mortality rates in the donor reserves. Um, to a large extent is that is true, except for um, poor old Somkanda game reserve here, which has uh, a mortality rate which far, far exceeds any of the other uh, receiver reserves. Overall, <coughs> it does seem to hold that receiver reserves have a lower mortality rate than donor reserves. However, again, slightly biased comparison. Why? Because um, very often, there are two kinds of removals that you do from protected areas. And if you, if you Pete Raynaud, you'll take the old and um, decrepit animals and you'll give them to somebody else and you'll keep the nice, healthy, fertile animals. So these guys are sometimes getting a whole lot of old, decrepit animals. But on the other hand, it's very often the young <coughs> and um, non-reproductive animals, the, the six, five and six and seven-year-olds that are being taken um, as a means of thinning the recruitment before it gets into the population. So sometimes reserves get very young populations, <coughs> and sometimes 
with, with potentially a few scattered old animals into it. So there's difficulties with this comparison, but in general, I think we, we can say we are experiencing low mortality rates. And I might add that included in this graph here is, for instance, the Pongola Game Reserve, that mortality rate, which is an outlier here, were some animals that were hit by trains and all that sort of thing on that protected area. So I, I've, I've, it's not a natural mortality, it's kind of an artificial one, but we have to deal with that in our, in our overall assessment of how successful the program is. Okay, so, so much for trying to examine those hypotheses. I think the important concern amongst managers is we've got to look after the donor populations. What, what about our donor populations and are we looking after them um, so that, that we will be able to continue uh, making donations into these programs? There's, there's three sets of curves here. The first set of curves are the three, do the three donor populations are... Um, in the in the rows, thank you. And what we what we're looking for here, this is a, a pop, this is this is the population uh, estimate against growth rate. What we're looking for, for here are signs of density dependence. Which populations are showing density dependence? And the density dependence is shown the the steepness of the graph. The steeper the graph, the the, the greater or the more likely you are experiencing density dependent effects. So in HIP, it would seem that the population is at a level where density dependence is probably not operating. In, in uh, Itala, it looks like density dependence is a factor there, and we've, we've got to try and deal with that. In Amkuzi, it's all over. It's a horrible kind of curve, and one wonders whether there's density dependence going <coughs> on here. Not, not quite sure about that one. The, in terms of trends in fecundity rate, these are temporal trends. What, was, what does one expect <coughs> as you are harvesting a population? You are expecting fecundity rate to go up. Okay, so we expect the graph to do that if our, if our program is working. There's absolutely no sign of that in any of these graphs. Okay? A concern. <coughs> With regard to mortality rate, we expect mortality rate to decline as we harvest and get the, the population into a state where it's producing productively. The only one that's really shown any kind of decline in mortality rate is HRP, whereas uh, Itala and Nkuzi are still all over the place. So there's no, uh, there's no uh, indication that, in this case, mortality has been related uh, to density in any way. All right, are there any wild cards? <laughs> It's perhaps unfortunate. This, these are <coughs> two bits of, of long-term rainfall data that I've managed to squeeze up here so that you can see them, but virtually the whole of Zululand is the same. When did we... Th these, this is a, a, a graph where you would look at uh, deviations uh, from the mean. The mean is zero. Deviations are good rainy years. Um, uh, sorry, positive deviations are good rainy years. Negative deviations are poor rainy years. Okay, has, the, has rainfall had anything to do with performance? Just look at the period when we started this program. Look at what we're dealing with during the program. Okay, and uh, again, here's another exactly the same thing in Mkuzi. These two, which are two, two, 150 kilometers apart, are showing exactly the same thing. Duma shows exactly the same thing. HIP shows the same thing. Eastern Shore shows the same thing. We've been trying to achieve a 5% growth rate in a situation where probably browse production is at its lowest level that anybody would, would uh, has in memory. Thank you. Just an interesting uh, thing here I've marked on this graph, some incidents that repeatedly come up in the history of, of Zululand. The first one is the <coughs> end of the 60s drought. This is when the HRP population of Black Rhino crashed, or the Shishlui one crashed. There's the end of the, the early 80s drought, which ended uh, with... Uh, by the Des Moines floods and so on and so forth. Again, everybody talks about major drought. Um, then there's the end of the, 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 um, the 90s drought. Okay? But look at what we've experienced over the last 12 years. And nobody even talks about it as being a drought. It, to me, it's extremely strange. Farmers are talking about it as being the green drought. How do you get a green drought? I'm not quite sure. But the question here is, I'm, I'm convinced rainfall has something to do with, with the performance of the population. It's very difficult to prove, 
prove that statistically. <coughs> the question we've got to say is what would have happened if we did not remove rhino from donor reserves? Would we, would we have been sitting in a situation that HRP was in at the end of the 60s? Again, this comes back to the kind of risk stuff that, that Chris was talking about earlier. Okay. In conclusion, population growth rates between donor and receiver reserves are not different at the moment. Fecundity rates are marginally higher on receiver reserves. Mortality rates are lower on receiver reserves. From this, we believe, if one is now going through our adaptive management iteration and saying, should we change what we're doing, I believe the current management strategy of removing a minimum of 5% per annum for range expansion is currently still supported. So I would like to see us continuing in this vein. And lastly, I would like to suggest that my <laughs> hypothesis about pack rhino being badly aged animals is supported. None of the, da the data is not clean. And I would like to just uh, uh, congratulate managers and uh, eco-advice people in particular for persisting to collect the quality of data that they have been on each population from each protected area that they've been doing. It's, it's really been great. Uh, Thank you so much, Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Pete's used up all of his time, but it's definitely a, also another good topic to have a good discussion on. The next talk is by Adrian Schrader from UKZN, um, and he'll be chatting to us about.